that's page 175, if my memory is working semi-adequately today. Yes, that is correct. So, how does the state of our heart affect our relationship with God? As we look at the life of Solomon today, the king who had it all, we're going to discover how easy it is to turn our hearts from full devotion to God to slipping away, to falling away. We disobey. We wonder whether our heart is dark or hardened or divided. The message about Solomon's life brings us back to the good habits of the heart that must be developed in our lives if there's going to be healthy spiritual growth and maturity. Those good habits of the heart are confession and community and worship and service and obedience. It's those habits that realign our wills with God's will and makes a difference in the way in which we live our life, and most importantly, how our life ends. And if you didn't get those five good habits, hang on, we'll get back to them in a minute, all right? You know, mid-April, second half of April, is the time of year when the thought of money drifts in and out of our mind quite frequently. You see, April the 17th this year, not the 15th, but this year the 17th, our mind drifted a lot towards the subject of taxes our depleted savings as a result of the taxes. We began to worry about the hounds of IRS. Sorry, precious. <laughs> we began to also wonder, is jail in my future? With the stock market doing its dipsy doodles, with the housing slump going on, for some families, the thought of college expenses looming on the horizon. For others, it's trying to decide when's retirement gonna take place. How am I going to find money to live on? How am I going to find money for school? For others, it's getting that very first job, or for some younger ones, finding their very first part-time job as summer comes up. Thoughts of money seem to surface this time of year. Generating, managing, dealing with wealth is an important part of the culture of this 21st century. It's so important that here at New Hope, we have two ministries devoted to it. Crown Ministries, Financial Peace University to help men and women think through these things wisely and biblically so that they're good stewards of those resources. It also seems to me that this is the time of year when many of us are transitioning in various stages of life, whether it is from high school to college, whether it's from college to a full-time job, whether it's our young adult life and raising our children or going through midlife, making the decision about going into those golden years of retirement. We all realize that the wisdom factor needs to go up in our lives. We are faced with many life decisions in the changing seasons of living. Issues like retirement, job change, this time of year, the wedding numbers go up considerably, people making that ultimate commitment for a lifetime. Graduation parties, just had one here at the church yesterday. Kind of an older graduate. Oh, Don, where are you? All right, I couldn't resist that. Don graduated from college where she works, actually. So that's awesome. People leaving school. Yeah. People looking for wisdom on how simply just to do life. We all want more wisdom. And I think we all want to manage our lives better. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever met anybody who says, nah, I don't need any more wisdom, I just want to keep living stupid? <laughs> ever met? We've met some folks who did that, but didn't necessarily say that, all right? So another kind of question. When you are looking for wisdom in a matter regarding your life, who do you turn to? In your own mind, who do you see as the wisest person you know? And that may be a couple of different people depending on the subject area, but, but who are the wise one in your life? I can tell you the Roland family, for a lot of years it was Mama June. Yeah. She was sharp, she was wise, she had experience, she never forgot anything, okay? Like Dad buying the suit, he wasn't supposed to. 
when they didn't have the, see that, she, but she used all of that to share with others so their life would be better. What face do you put to wisdom in your world? What field of expertise do they come from? Would this be wisdom for decisions that you need to make concerning finance or business or relationships or school? To whom do you go and how often do you seek their wisdom? We can look back historically at great wisdom teachers and we can read their writings. People like Socrates or Plato. We can look to other great writers like Shakespeare and Twain. And I'm not talking about Shania. <laughs> People can read from a lot of different spheres. Uh, from books off the bookshelf in order to find wisdom for life. Not only are we in need of wisdom, but also, who's the wealthiest person you know? He talks about help with finances. Who do you think of? Whether they've made their wealth in real estate or entertainment or through managing in the financial industry, business and sports. Now, granted, not all the folks who have a lot of money have a lot of brain power. Okay? They all didn't get it simply because they were smart. I think I'm going to share this later, but it's popping in my brain right now. I read a statistic not too long ago that 60% of the retired professional basketball players file bankruptcy. <laughs> they made a lot, didn't hold on to a lot. But often we want to know, how did they achieve it? You know that folks have arrived at a status of wealth and wisdom when everybody knows them by their first name or by their initials. <laughs> Okay? They have made it. Uh, Bono. <coughs> Oprah. The Donald. W. Brittany. There's one to go to for wisdom. MJ. <laughs> Tiger. You knew every one of those folks just by their initials or their first name. Most of you know that... Uh, if there were 500 people in a room just hanging out and visiting, if any one of those folks walked in, heads would turn. Many would turn cameras their direction. Others would get autograph books out. People would surround them with questions. They, they want to hear from them. Even if they don't have all that much to tell us, somehow we, we get enamored. Here in Fresno, in, in, in my particular field, there were two like that. GL. Didn't they see any more? All right, everybody knew when you said GL. Buf. Okay? Everybody knew who you were talking about. Just those two names. All right. Well known. Well, they were well respected, and we sought wisdom from them. Well, we've got a one neighbor like that we're going to look at today, and his name is Solomon. He is the king who had it all. He had wealth, he had faith, he had wisdom. He had wives. Oh boy, did he have wives. <laughs> 700 wives. And one man tell me today, Solomon was his hero. Any man who could make 700 wives happy, he had to be his hero. <laughs> his cup ran over. And he drowned in that cup, let me tell you. Quite often it's hard for us to get a scope of the great wealth of Solomon. It was the Queen of Sheba who said, Hey, King, the half hasn't been told. Before I actually came and saw you, before I, I saw everything with my own eyes, I thought everybody had exaggerated what you were worth. The half hasn't been told, she said. It is underestimated. But you and I, the average Joe, we, we have a tough time putting that kind of wealth in some sort of concept. So let me see if I can assist you just briefly this morning. In a 2003 article in Money Magazine. Now, I do not subscribe to Money Magazine. I have no need to. But on occasion, you see it laying out, and you pick it up, and you look at an article that's there. And that was the case this one. There was an article about Bill Gates. All of you know who Bill Gates is, right? The founder of Microsoft Corporation. Here's a perspective from Microsoft and Bill Gates. In the 2003 balance sheet, that was printed in that magazine article, it was something to behold. On that balance sheet were a list of assets, furniture, fixtures, building, real estate, all those would fall to your mind. But they were small compared to one line item called cash. Any of y'all acquainted with that line item? <laughs> cash. Here is what was printed there. The asset on the line called cash. $40 billion. 
dollars, liquid cash in the bank. That's some checkbook power, let me tell you. Forty billion dollars. It's hard to get your head around how much money that is. So think about it this way. In that article, they said with forty billion dollars cash, they could have purchased the Ford Corporation, Exxon, Mobil, and Walmart combined. And there would have been enough cash left over to purchase four space shuttles. Wow. All right, that doesn't work for you. How about this analogy? With that $40 billion, he could have purchased every professional football, basketball, and baseball, and hockey team in America. Maybe not the Dodgers now. But everybody else he could have purchased. That's some serious pocket change, folks. That's financial bling. So when Bill Gates walks into a room, head turns. But Solomon's wealth would have made Gates look like a pauper. So when we read the story, we are talking about a guy with a single name, Solomon, who was the wisest and the wealthiest ever. He was a poet, a songwriter, a soothsayer, a king, a business tycoon, a master builder. He had it all. And as we read, we realize he had a whole lot more, and it all wasn't good. Research, if you all have heard this analogy before, research indicates to us that if we put a frog in a pot of boiling water, he will instantly jump out of the pot. But if you put a frog in a pot of room temperature water, He'll start doing the backstroke. He will just kick back and think he is in frog heaven. And then you turn the Bunsen burner on. And it gradually increases in temperature one degree at a time. That frog will just kick back and die. He will be cooked to death. You will have a fine dinner. It will taste a lot like chicken. The frog will be dead. And the frog story is a metaphor for the person in the story whose life we're looking at today, Solomon, the son of David and Bathsheba. Solomon was a frog who could jump over any lily pad in the kingdom. He was blue-blooded royalty. He was a frog that any princess would kiss, and he kissed over 700 of them. <laughs> but Solomon got himself in lukewarm water, and by the end, his goose was cooked. He started strong, but he got into the pot. By the end, he ends very, very poorly. The story begins in verse 1 Kings chapter 1, chapter 13 in our storybook. When we come to Solomon's reign in the story, we're coming to the end of an era. This time period is defined by the United Monarchy. It's the time when Israel was united and they had one king. The day was coming after the death of Solomon that the king would be divided in two and instead of one king, there would be two. But by this point, we've seen God create a people who have stumbled and fallen. He's blessed them through his covenant relationships with them from the beginning of time, starting with Adam and Eve. He then protected Noah and he saved his family through the flood. God judged those who had rebelled against him, but he kept his promise to Noah and the family. And then through Abraham, he established a new community of people called Israel. And God said, by the way I relate to Israel and by the way Israel loves me, I want the rest of the world to know that I am the one true living God who would like to love them as well. God didn't want only Israel to have a relationship with him, but through Israel, he wanted the rest of the world to know who he was. Abraham was a blessing to many beyond his own lifetime. And then there came the tribes of Israel through the seed, the descendants of Isaac and Jacob. We studied Joseph's story many weeks ago. Then Moses was raised up by God to redeem Israel and to help get God's people out of 400 years of bondage and slavery. Moses led them down to the Sinai and gave them the law and the covenants. He directed them in their wilderness wanderings and brought them to the brink of the promised land. Then the leadership of Joshua took over, and they inherited the land that God said would be theirs for all time. 
The people had their ups and downs just like you and I do. They had a cycle we talked about of sin and oppression from other people. Then they would repent and God would raise up a deliverer called the judge and he would save them. And that cycle of sinning and repenting and deliverance took place again and again and again over 300 years. And then we come to the point where we started a few weeks ago. This period called the time of the kings. God raises up kings because the people wanted a king. Kingship was permitted by God and encouraged sometimes by him. But God was really longing and hoping that Israel would want him to be their one and only king. As a matter of fact, during the period of the judges, and we didn't go there, but we talked, remember Gideon? And we talked about his leadership. God used Gideon to become a general of an army. And, and thousands showed up, but God ended up giving Gideon just 300 soldiers. And they had this incredible victory and this string of victories under Gideon. Did you know that the people at that time wanted to make Gideon king? The youngest member from the poorest family, from the least of all the tribes of Israel, all the people wanted to make him king. And you know what Gideon said? Gideon said, no way. He said, we already have a king. He is the great I am. I don't want to be your king. God is our king. But over the years, the people continue to clamor. And God finally gives them what they wanted. And so he gives them Saul, first of all. God wasn't so much excited about Saul, but the people wanted it. They insisted, so he said, I'll give you what you want. Well, you and I must remember... It's back in Deuteronomy 17. Just write this down. Don't go there yourself right now. But in Deuteronomy 17, back when it was the time of Moses, Moses knew that the day would come that Israel would have a king. And just as Moses from God had given Israel the Ten Commandments, and just as God through Moses gave Israel the direction on how to worship him, and just as God through Moses gave the people their dietary laws, God gave to Israel through Moses some direction on how to, to choose a king and how a king, once chosen, should behave. And it's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 17. I'm going to read just two verses, verses 14, actually four verses, 14 through 18. Here's what it said in Deuteronomy. Here's what's going to happen. When you enter the land that God is going to give you and you settle in it, you're going to say, let us have a king like other nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be among your brothers. Do not put a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king must not acquire a great number of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take too many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold when he takes the throne as his kingdom. He is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law. In other words, the one who is king was to personally hand write this out for his own use. So he would not only be told how to behave, he would not only read how to behave, but he would write about how to behave. Use all of his sensory perception so God could be confident he understood what his directions were. And it goes on and on about what the law for the king and what kind of king they were to have. So they got Saul. <laughs> Saul does not follow these guidelines. He fails miserably. Then we have David. David is a much better king. We heard that story just two weeks ago. Now we come to Solomon. Solomon's life. What does he learn? What as king does he have to teach us? Whenever we look at someone's life, we look at what they do, what they say, the kind of person that's indicated by their behavior, their accomplishments, and what they think inside themselves. Solomon was definitely a wise guy. No question. Bright, intelligent, man full of wisdom. Let's look at uh, Solomon, the sage. He was the wisest person who ever lived. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 29 through 34, or page 178 in the story. I'll give you the paragraph. 178. Okay. Last paragraph on page 178. And it says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Have you ever counted sand on a seashore? That's a whole bunch, folks. 
That's a lot. And that's how his wisdom was described. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the men of the East. Greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than any other man, and it could be said, than all other men that put together. Men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by the kings of the world who had heard his wisdom. Notice, they recognized that Solomon's wisdom came from God. Ambassadors sent from other nations to hear what Solomon had to say with this wisdom that comes from God. What God wanted to have happen in the nation of Israel, it was happening. People were coming to hear about the God of Israel from the wise man Solomon. All of us want wisdom, right? But let's also be honest. Sometimes wisdom doesn't sound all that profound. Sometimes people say things that sound really profound, but it's not all that wise. And a lot of good common sense wisdom is it, it's 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 kind of like some of the best wisdom I've ever read was in a little book called "Don't Squat with Your Spurs On." <laughs> now that's wisdom, folks. I mean, if you've ever done that, you won't do it again. And so if somebody tells it's, and, and that book is filled with lots of little antidotes just like that. It's wise, but it doesn't always sound that good. Let me give you a few other examples. How about a hair dryer in a motel room that says, do not use while sleeping? <laughs> a shower box cap. A cotton cap in a shower box in a hotel. Just read this one a couple of weeks ago. On the side it said, fits one head. <laughs> Have you ever tried to put two heads in one shower cap? i got to be honest, now that I've read that, I really want to try that. <laughs> Shelly gets better. I'm going to have her get in the shower with me. We're going to try to our heads. Both our heads, all right? All right. On the packaging for a Rowenta iron, do not iron clothes while on body. It's good wisdom. This is what On a children's cough medicine, this is for children 12 years and younger, do not drive a car or operate machinery. <laughs> A string of Christmas lights. You all have read this one. These are for indoor and outdoor use only. <laughs> Do we have other options? <laughs> okay, last one. Last one. I've read this one. This didn't come out of a book. I've I literally read this one. On the package of nuts that I got from American Airlines, it has instructions. Open packet. Then eat nuts. <laughs> that helps, doesn't it? Have any of you ever tried it the other way? <laughs> but Solomon, Solomon, he gives us real wisdom, and a lot of it is recorded in the story. Not all of it. All of Solomon's wisdom is recorded here. But part of it was abridged and included in the story. In fact, you'll find it on pages 179 through 183. I'm not going to read all those, but let me highlight a few that I think are specifically very important for us. About a relationship with God with others. Listen to what he says in verses 3 through 6 of Proverbs 3. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and humankind. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. He gives us some wisdom about evil, but in verses 7 and 8 of that same chapter, He says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. About money, notice what he says. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Folks, you've been here around this whole very long, you know, I, I, I hardly ever preach on money around here. You've never heard me preach one sermon here on tithing. It's not that I'm, I'm opposed to it, but I'm, I'm all for it, quite frankly. But 
I'm not for it in such a way that I think I've got to tell you and legislate to you. But here's a passage that has nothing to do about tithing. What it does tell you, though, is your first fruits of everything. It said, no, it's all crops. Not what's left over. At the very first, you ought to give if you want God's blessing in the area of your finances. And blessing doesn't mean that you can have a Rolex watch and a Mercedes Benz. Nothing wrong with either one of those. That's not the promise God says. He says he will bless us when we are man. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. A couple of more proverbs from Solomon that I think indicate that he knew about lukewarm pots of water to avoid. Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Lukewarm? Hey, everybody else in the world is doing it. It's bound to be okay. Your goose will be cooked. Number two, sluggards. They do not plow in season, so at harvest they look, but they find nothing. They don't plow in season. That's the pot of lukewarm water. In other words, there's nothing to cook when it's harvest time. Third one, food gained by fraud tastes sweet. That's the lukewarm pot of water. But you end up with a mouth full of gravel. That's getting cooked. A gossip betrays a confidence. That's the cooked part. You lose friends because you betrayed a confidence. The lukewarm water to avoid is anyone who talks too much. If you curse your father and mother, that's the lukewarm water. Thinking that it's no big deal. Your lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. That's the cooked part, kids. An inheritance claim too soon. I just watched for the second or third time the movie late the other night until they couldn't sleep of the Mendez brothers. They wanted their inheritance too soon. That's the lukewarm water. They will not be blessed at the end that their goose is cooked. Last, those who shut their eyes to the cry of the poor. That's lukewarm water. They will also cry out and not be answered. That's the cooked part. And folks, you can show up today right after the third service right over there and help respond to the cry of the poor and present. The point is this. Solomon knew all about what happens to frogs that stay in the pot of lukewarm water. There is some great wisdom found in Proverbs. A lot of people walk through the book of Proverbs. They do a chapter a day every month of the year just so they can have this wisdom exposed to them again and again and again. Proverbs lays out very nicely 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Most months of the year have 31 days in it. There's a couple of months you'd have to read two chapters on the last day. And then February really messes with your mind. Sometimes you have to read four or three on the very last day. But by and large, most months, one chapter of Proverbs every day, and you'll be exposed to this great wisdom. Uh, just one more for the fun of it. One proverb about a wife. It says, better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. <laughs> Notice I picked the Sunday that my wife was not present. <laughs> Actually, I read where one woman said, if Solomon had been a woman, he would have written, men, who needs them? <laughs> but anyway, there's a lot of wisdom in the book of Proverbs, and so we can learn from Solomon. He had wisdom, and he shared it. And we, have, we can read it with very little cost. We can avail ourselves to the greatest wisdom of all times. But not only was he a wise man, Solomon was also a great builder. In about 960 B.C., about 480 years after the Exodus, 180,000 workers went to work for seven years on the temple. Think about that. 180,000 workers for seven years. That is long. That is much. I don't feel so bad about our pavilion now. <laughs> Here's the deal, guys. Do you realize the temple was not far from the size of the sanctuary that you're sitting in? Size-wise, yeah, it was a little more costly. Okay, it wasn't made just with, with with wood and plaster and a little glass here. It was made of gold. A lot of fine craftsmanship went into all of that. 
108,000 people, craftsmen, worked on it for seven years. What an awesome thing it was. And Solomon was also a builder of a palace for himself. Interestingly, it took seven years to build God's temple, and it took 13 years to build Solomon's house. Wow. Pause just for a brief moment, because maybe we're seeing a little niche in the wisdom of Solomon. It was David who many years before stood and looked at his own house and he said, what a shame. I have a place to live, but there's no place to put the Ark of the Covenant, which is the representation of God's presence in our midst. And David set about collecting and putting together everything that Solomon would need to build the house of God. David was ashamed that he had a place to live and God's presence didn't have a visible reflection. Solomon takes care of that and then he says, I need something bigger than what God has. Twice the length of time to build where Solomon went. He also built ships and cities. He also built homes for, all, for many of his wives. He built one as a palace for his daughter when she got married. Ooh, what a gift. He had chariots and horses and he even had cities built for his chariots and horses. This is a guy who could build. Not only was he a wise man and a builder, but he was a writer. A thousand and five songs he wrote. Three thousand proverbs. He's cranking out three or four songs a week and five or ten proverbs a week. Plus all the building stuff. Plus leading Israel. Plus making decisions about who's going to get the baby. All kinds of stuff provided he was also Solomon the worshiper. He built a temple to give glory to God. And then we read in 1 Kings chapter 8 this incredible prayer of dedication. And here you know this man Solomon had a heart that did at that moment want to exalt and worship God. And he dedicates that space to the glory of God. And then on page 191, or in 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 23 through 26, is kind of a summary of Solomon at this point of the story. And on page uh, uh, 191, it is at the first paragraph. Okay, first paragraph. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear what? The wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, anyone who came brought a gift. Silver and gold, robes, weapons, spices, horses, mules. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses, 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. I mean, this guy had it. And it would have been a great story if it ended right here. I mean, Solomon becomes king, anointed, builds a temple, leads the people, gives wisdom and guidance. End of story. This would be a great place just to move right on. This is not the end of the story. We had a great start. The man who turned heads now turns his heart away from God. Early on, he started an alliance with Egypt by marrying the daughter of Pharaoh. That's back on page 176 of the story. We know that Solomon had many wives and a lot of marriages in those days were done often for strength, influence, and power. It was just to show that he was bigger and better than the other guys. It was a muscle move, a power play. The accumulation of wives, concubines, horses, chariots, gold, silver, he had all of this. But, but do you remember <coughs> about 15 minutes ago when I read to you out of Deuteronomy 17, the law of the kings? Do you remember the king must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself? Do you remember it said he must not go back to Egypt? And he goes back and he marries Pharaoh's daughter? He must not take many wives and he had more wives than any other king ever did? Why? Because the scripture said back in Deuteronomy 17, many wives will lead your heart astray. What God had said earlier in the story in 1 Kings chapter 2 and 1 Kings chapter 3 and 1 Kings chapter 9. In fact, if you turn to page, here's a key question. Has this ever happened to you? Have you 
you ever ignored the warnings that God has given to you? I mean, it's easy to look at Solomon and say, I'm a wise man, and three times, and he, 